Welcome to the History Guy Podcast, a podcast dedicated to stories of lesser-known historical events told by Lance Geiger, also known as the History Guy on YouTube. I'm Josh, your host, a writer for the channel and eldest son of the History Guy. We tell all kinds of stories about history, from the modern era to the ancient past, so you never know what we're going to talk about next. One thing you can be sure of, it is history that deserves to be remembered. This episode of Forgotten History is brought to you by Magellan TV a new kind of streaming service that aims to bring you the best documentaries from around the world. We at The History Guy are also excited to announce a new way to interact with the team and The History Guy himself at Locals.com. Join The History Guy Guild for your one-stop location to chat with other history fans, get updates on the team, and more. You can join for free or pay as little as $5 a month to get access to live chats with The History Guy, looks behind the scenes, early access to ad-free videos, and more. Find us at historyguyguild.locals.com. We look forward to seeing you there. On today's episode, we chat about two heroes of the American Civil War who fought against frightful odds to secure better lives for themselves and their people. First is the incredible story of Robert Smalls, who at 22 years old decided on an audacious plan to escape slavery and escape to the Union. Then the History Guy will talk about Abraham Galloway, an almost forgotten American who escaped slavery only to return to the South to act as a spy for the Union Army. Without further ado, let me introduce the History Guy. America's very excited right now about a new movie that's out that stars a black superhero. And of course, that's notable because black lead roles are really fairly uncommon in Hollywood movies and black superhero roles even more rare. And with no disrespect whatsoever to that film, what I would say as the history guy is that if you wanted to make a film about a black superhero, you should have made a film about Robert Smalls, a man whose heroism throughout his life was so amazing that he deserved the title superhero, if anyone ever did. And his story deserves to be remembered. Robert Smalls was born into slavery in 1839 in Beaufort, South Carolina. His mother was a slave and his father is not known, although it may well have been his owner, Henry McKee. When Robert was just 12 years old, his owner, McKee, started running him out as a day laborer, with, of course, McKee keeping the money. As Robert was interested in the sea, he started taking most of his work down by the Charleston docks, first as a stevedore, unloading boats or doing dock work, but eventually on the boats themselves as a sailor, a fisherman, a a sailmaker, whatever would take him out to sea. And eventually, he became so familiar with the coastline of South Carolina that he became a skilled boat pilot, even though a black man in that era would not have been called a pilot. He was probably called a a wheel man. In 1856, he married a fellow slave, a, a hotel maid named Hannah Smith, who had two daughters of her own, and then together they had two more children, a daughter and a son, who died at a young age. They were doing well enough that they were allowed to live in a home separate from their owners, but of course most of their pay still went to their owners. The Civil War started literally just out front Robert's door at Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor. The Confederacy recognized Robert's skill and pressed him into service as the wheelman aboard the CSS Planter, a sidewheel steamer that had been converted into an armed dispatch boat. The planter delivered dispatches, troops, and supplies, as well as laid mines, then called torpedoes, to protect Charleston Harbor. Robert was a trusted member of the crew, and his piloting skills were valuable, given his knowledge and experience with the coast. But like any human who is treated as property, Robert really yearned for freedom, and that was particularly true then because Hannah's master had become abusive, and he was afraid that that master was going to sell Hannah away. He wanted to buy Hannah's freedom, but he didn't have nearly enough money, and so they had to escape. And in May of 1862, he saw his opportunity to do that. Smalls had noticed that the Confederate officers made a habit of leaving the ship at night, so he and the other eight slaves aboard hatched a plan. On May 12, 1862, the planter was docked in Charleston, carrying a load of four cannon that were intended to add to the city's defenses. When, in the evening, the officers left the ship, Smalls and the crew took the boat, met their families at a prearranged spot in the harbor, and fled to the Union blockade. This was no simple feat. Had they been caught, they would have all certainly been executed. The harbor was well defended, with five Confederate harbor forts, each capable of destroying the boat. But Smalls knew all the proper signals, and even impersonated the captain standing at the front of the boat. Once free of the harbor, they lowered the Confederate flag and put up a white sheet, hoping the ships of the Union blockade would see it. Yet they were still nearly fired upon by the Federal blockade fleet. 
As the captain of the armed clipper, USS Onward, seeing the Confederate gunboat, ordered the guns to ready, a crewman with binoculars saw Smalls and his compatriots waving frantically from the deck. Once the captain of the Onward boarded the planter, Smalls reportedly asked him if they had a Union flag that the ship could fly. Incredibly, Small's audacious plan had not only allowed him to steal a Confederate warship from a well-defended harbor and deliver it to the Union, but also to deliver nine families from slavery. No superhero ever accomplished more. Small's became a hero in the Union, but the Confederacy put a $4,000 bounty on his head. His knowledge of the Charleston Harbor and defenses was invaluable to the Union, and he ended up serving as a pilot aboard a number of Union warships, including the now USS Planter. Having planted mines for the Confederacy, now he helped the Union to disarm them. An 1883 naval report noted that he participated in 17 Civil War battles and engagements, including serving as a pilot aboard the ironclad USS Keokuk during the disastrous attack on Charleston, April 7th of 1863, where the ship was savaged by Fort Sumter's guns. The heavily damaged ship was able to withdraw under her own power, due in large part to Small's considerable piloting skills. In December of 1863, he was back aboard USS Planter when the steamer got caught in a crossfire between Union and Confederate troops near Folly Island. The captain of the boat, James Nickerson, panicked and ordered the boat to surrender. Smalls refused, knowing that he and the other black sailors would face execution if they were captured. He took command and was able to navigate the boat outside the Confederate guns. For his heroism, he was made captain of the planter, the first black man to command a United States ship. During the war, he engaged in other heroics as well. He was instrumental in convincing Abraham Lincoln and Secretary of War Edwin Stanton to allow the recruitment of black troops into the Union Army and helped to recruit former slaves for the 1st Volunteer South Carolina Regiment, one of the first black regiments. He supported efforts to raise money to educate former slaves, and he himself achieved literacy. He was voted an unofficial delegate to the Republican National Convention in 1864. Also that year, when he was forced to give up his seat to a white passenger on a Philadelphia streetcar, he left the car rather than sit in the open overflow platform. That small act of rebellion helped to motivate the state of Pennsylvania to integrate public transportation in 1867. In Robert Smalls, whose heroics to this point I think already qualify him for superhero status, did not end his heroics with the end of the war. Following the Civil War, the South went through a period that was called Radical Reconstruction. Spurred by the 14th and 15th Amendments, which guaranteed the right of black Americans to vote, black Americans were able to participate in the American political process for the first time. So-called Union Leagues were created, essentially as a branch of the Republican Party, and encouraged political activism on the part of black citizens. This facilitated a period of Republican domination of Southern politics. Robert Smalls was part of this. He was a delegate to the 1868 South Carolina Constitutional Convention. He was elected to the State House of Representatives and then to the State Senate, and in 1874 was elected to the United States House of Representatives. But this was a brutal era in U.S. politics, where anti-Reconstructionists frequently used violence and intimidation, often through shadow organizations of the Democrats, such as the Ku Klux Klan and the South Carolina Red Shirts. 35 African-American officials were murdered by such organizations during the period of Reconstruction. Small's life was threatened by a group of armed red shirts at a political rally in 1876. Over his long political career, he had to endure threats of violence, false and trumped-up charges, and open intimidation of voters. One contemporary observer noted in her diary, Political times are simply frightful. Men are shot at, hounded down, trapped and held till certain meetings are over, and intimidated in every possible way. Eventually, Democrats won back the South and enacted numerous constitutional and legal changes designed to disenfranchise the black vote. Robert Smalls conducted his long political career during an era where serving meant risking his life. And the mere act of a black man voting was an act of heroism in the face of violence. Ten minutes is far too short a time to go over all the causes and crusades of Robert Smalls. The man who escaped slavery by audaciously stealing a Confederate warship underneath their very noses, never backed down in the face of adversity. The young man who had to flee slavery because he could not afford to purchase his wife's freedom, after the war used the money given to him by the Union as a prize for capturing the CSS planter to purchase his former owner's home. The young man who was central to the Union decision to incorporate black troops into the Union Army eventually was made a major general in the South Carolina militia. 
In 2004, when the U.S. Army named a massive Besson-class logistic support vehicle the USAV Major General Robert Smalls, it became the first U.S. Army vessel to be named after an African American. Through it all, he faced threats of violence and discrimination. In the end, he even had to fight for his pension. It turns out that the first black captain of United States ship was, because of his race, never officially commissioned. Robert Small served throughout the Civil War 17 engagements, technically, as a civilian. Robert Smalls died of diabetes in 1915 at the age of 75. On his monument is a quotation from a statement he made to the South Carolina legislature in 1895. My race needs no special defense. Their history in this country proves them to be the equal of any man anywhere. All they need is an equal chance in the battle of life. Now is the part of the episode where we get to chat with the history guy. A little bit about what you just heard, what you're going to hear, and some behind-the-scenes stuff that you only get to hear about on the podcast. Robert Small's career is simply incredible. By any measure, he was an audacious and capable person. What, uh, what brought him to your attention? Uh, you know, this is one of the earliest episodes that I made. Uh, I mean, it's, it's very early on in the history guide. And uh, you know, I think it was just because it was such a, a crazy, incredible story. Uh, and uh, I mean, I think that's you know why it just seemed like a great fit for the history guys to be able to tell a story like that. I don't you know I don't know where I first heard of him. In fact, that's just something I stumbled into reading or something that I'd, I'd heard like years before. Uh, but the, the thing that surprised me when I did the research for it, and this you know going back because when I was like this was made I think in 2017, but uh, is that I had heard the story of him stealing the boat from Charleston Harbor. I, I didn't even know that's the entire story, but I really didn't know the story of his life after and all that he did after. You know, and that was ex it's. He's an extraordinary man in so many ways, uh, and the idea that you had someone who started out as a slave, who who you know just through really guts and audacity became uh, an important pilot on the river there or on the, in, the, in the harbor there, uh, even as a slave, but then ends up you know ends up serving in state legislatures, ends up uh, a, a major general in the in the South Carolina militia. I mean, he, I mean, it's what an incredible story that that is. So I mean, there's there was even more story there than I realized. So I think it's something where I just heard Truly. one piece of the story and I thought, oh, that fits for the history guy. And then when I went to research, it, I was like, wow, you know, this is he's truly a hero for the ages. Because just just alone, I mean, that that act of taking that boat would have been worthy of of oh talking gosh. about. But it is amazing. That I can't that imagine. Just the beginning. You know, I, I was not thinking of anything like that when I was 22 years old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. That Me story, neither. I mean, that story in itself is an amazing story. It's enough to tell a whole episode on. And then he has so much story that comes after that. And, and uh, you know, he saved he saved Union ships twice uh, uh, just because he was very good at what he did. And uh, and actually ends up commanding a ship as, as, as a black man. And of course, the Navy, uh, there was a lot more opportunity for black people in the Union Navy than there was in the, on the ground forces. But I mean, he ends up being, you know, very important in recruiting uh, the black troops too and, and then getting the united states to accept taking in black troops and one of his you know many different functions and in many ways it's the stuff after the civil war i mean when your life is literally at risk if you were a freedman in the south trying to say you know advocate for um, you know more black voting and advocate for black rights and education and all the things they're advocating for every day when he got up there was wow. someone who wanted to shoot him to death and that was that was maybe even more brave than facing fire during the war i mean he just he never backed down ever and, and an amazing, absolutely amazing guy. And he was because, like you, like you said, he was only twenty-two when he took that yeah. ship. <laughs> and it is, ship, it's yeah. just an incredible. He he knew how much danger he was in, and yeah. but he knew what he could get if he if he was if he was willing and brave enough and, to do it. And what well, what the risk was if he didn't? I mean, so I mean, he really was pushing. You can talk about him being brave there, but he was pushing to corners. You know, his family was going to be split up uh, or, or potentially die if he didn't act. Uh, and but I mean that yeah. uh, I mean it was so carefully done, and he saved everybody's family. And he knew he knew which ones he could trust. He knew what he couldn't trust. He knew how to earn the officers' trust in the way that he needed to do it. Uh, he'd learned things that he needed to get without them knowing that he'd learned. And the thing they thought through that was interesting to me is that their biggest fear was then when we get to the Union blockade, how do we keep them from sinking us? Because that's what they're supposed to do, uh, and and that they had thought that through. And I mean it was it was a very uh, well planned escape. Uh, as, as audacious as it was, it's as audacious as any POW escape from the Second World War, uh, and, and so it's. I mean, it, that's an extraordinary story in itself. And you're right, a, a young man he took control of that, and and uh, it's you know it's astounding to even think about 
how brave you'd have to be to stand on the front of that boat wearing the captain's hat, giving the signals, you know, to, to, to yeah. leave the harbor, uh, knowing that they would they would happily, without a second thought, they would murder you and your family if they knew what you were doing. I mean, that's, uh, I mean, it's, for him to stand up there to do that. Absolutely. And he couldn't know that he was going to find sh sure safety. He really, he was concerned because, and reasonably concerned that the union would be like, ah, oh, this is a boat trying to get out. Uh, or, you know, see it as some kind of threat or a trick or whatever. And, and later he gets paid for the boat. I mean, that's awesome. It's, it's like the union actually reimbursed him for capturing the boat. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah it's, it's, a great, it's a great story. But, I mean, and it could have gone, and, I, you know, I don't know. Would we remember his name if it went differently? Would we remember his name if they were caught or if the, if the plan had fallen through? We wouldn't. Uh, and so, I mean, you know, he's... It could uh, have and gone I'm wrong, sure, wrong in any number of ways. Yeah, and, and, and we might not know. I'm sure that there are many more people trying to escape slavery who took great risks, and uh, we we never learned it either because they, you know, they made it uh, along the the railway and they never told their stories, or they didn't make it, and so their story was never told. Uh, it's just extraordinary, also, that we got to know this story uh, because there's probably many more stories like this that we never got. To, well, maybe not quite like the nice like Confederate warship, but I mean, <laughs> many more stories that were as brave as this one because you were risking your family every time if you tried to to leave. Uh, and uh, you know, up until the Civil War, the, everywhere in the nation, they would still hunt you down. I mean, you had to you had to make a problem. So I live in southern Illinois, and there's a lot of stuff here that's along the uh, the, the Underground Railway. Even though uh, Illinois was a free state, the Fugitive Slave Act meant it's still pursued here. So if you made it here to where I am in, this, in, in southern Illinois, you still had to make it about 100 miles north of here before you were generally pretty safe. Uh, and so there's still, you know, old buildings here have, have you know, hidey holes where they would hide people uh, that were on the railroad and stuff like that. Uh, and so I'm, I'm, I'm sure that there were acts because you're, you're literally fighting for your freedom, for your family's freedom, for, your, uh, for survival. I'm sure there were acts of bravery like this all the time that we never got to hear the story. Yeah. His, his, it just comes, I, you know, not just that we've heard the story, but I mean, like stealing a Confederate warship. It's just such a, such a you know, he didn't just get away. He's like, oh, by the way, here's, here's a fully outfit of warship. And I know where all the mines are in the harbor, too. So, uh, yeah. He's, <laughs> and he was willing to go forward and continue to to face danger. He, yeah. He didn't want to just, you know, go try Absolutely. to find someplace safe. He he wanted to go back and help people. And I, and that was, I mean, I think that. And he knew that, it, that there was a price on his yeah. head that they would, that if they caught him again, he, they, they were going to kill him. They would hang him in a second thought. And then, you know, twice he essentially saved federal ships because he knew if the ship fell into Confederate hands, it would kill all the black men on board, all the freedmen yeah. on board. Uh, so, yeah, but he continued to put himself in danger because he believed in the cause and he knew what he was doing was important because he knew that there were other people that were in the position he was in when he escaped. Uh, and, uh, and there's just so much beautiful symmetry to the story. I mean, he steals the boat. He gets the bounty for the boat. He uses that to buy his master's home. And then he was fond enough of his master that he let his the master's widow live in the house until she died. I mean, man. You know, this wow. is this is one of those truth. Just truth is just a more compelling story than anything you ever see made up in fiction. Uh, and uh, you know, I would love to have met him. Uh, yeah. I'm sure that he was absolutely extraordinary to, to converse with. I I cannot possibly imagine how it must feel to have been held as a slave at that mansion, and then to have left and come back and be able to be the master of that house. I I yeah. That has just got to be. I mean, that's that's got to be something that is doesn't get to happen very often. Yeah, I, that's, that's got to be the sign that you made it when you when the slave ends up owning the house. Yeah, the enslaved person ends up owning the house. So. To have the magnanimity to uh, let, to let the widow live there uh, is is really quite. I mean, it's it's incredible because yeah. he, he well, didn't I mean, have to do that for, for any reason. Yeah, I mean, he seemed to think that he was well taken care of. It was his, his wife's master that he was afraid of uh, selling him out. But I mean, and if you think about it, if you think about what that means, I mean, you know, they let me live free and only give them most of my salary for not, you know, for, you know, for the privilege. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so, uh, but apparently he did carry either some fondness there or, or he simply believed he didn't want to turn an old widow out of her home. Uh, but uh, uh, that, I mean, that you can find forgiveness for what happened to him too. I mean, there's so many reasons he's, it's an extraordinary story. I mean, the, the, the incredibly brave things that he did, that he continued to subject himself to risk because of the causes that he believed in. But also, I mean, that's uh, how many of you could find forgiveness for the, the person that literally owns you. Um, and your family. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, I, you, you have to wonder because I mean, he did some extraordinary things. The first, he was the first black elector for a Republican Party. I think that was him. Uh, and uh, 
but it was at a time when you know politics and you know before uh, Reconstruction collapsed too. But uh, uh, and he actually got into some you know rough and tumble in Republican politics even. But you have to think if it's a different time, uh, you know what kind of leader you know he really could have been given who he was, uh, and uh, because I think he I think he achieved. Know, so much more than you would imagine he could have achieved yeah. given the obstacles at the time but i mean yeah I, I don't know i just feel like there's someone here that could have been like a fantastic president someone who could have been a world leader someone i mean someone who's got yeah. that kind of both courage uh, and compassion and vision and all that stuff that goes together and uh, yeah he's just uh, it, it's you cannot read about the man and not just say wow i mean how did how did someone really in this time live the life that he lived and be the person that he, that he was. And, it, and it, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a symbol for all of us. I mean, if any of us could try to do, you know, in life to make the difference that he made, hopefully we don't have to risk our lives stealing the boat. But, I mean, if, if, any, if, if there were more people willing to risk all to do what's right in the way that Robert Smalls did, how much better would the world be? And it's, it's a good reason to tell history uh, because he truly, truly deserves to be remembered. I understand that there's a, a movie being made about him right now. We have there have been a, several attempts, but there's a movie in production about Robert Spalls, at least about the. Uh, oh, wow. I think it's um, I think it's focusing uh, focusing on the the, the boat, but uh, the theft of the of the boat. Uh, but he deserves it. I mean, he absolutely deserves. It. I, you can you can tell that you can tell that story if you tell it well. You can just tell the history and not have to deviate from the history and have a story that's absolutely compelling and exciting and thrilling and. Well, and you've always said that this, uh, you were saying this even when you did this episode originally, that this would this would make a great film. And it's a true story yeah. based on a guy who was just willing to willing to do whatever he he had to for both himself and his family and his community and his people. And it's it really is. It's I mean, it's just a. Uh, well, the, he, just, he just keeps doing the impossible. Yeah. He just doesn't because <laughs> it, it, it just doesn't believe that he can't. I mean, and so I mean, he's truly a superhero. He did he? He went beyond anything that you could expect at the time because he was simply he had the courage to do that, and and it sets him apart. It's a it's a fantastic story. Buying his former master's mansion still just just does shock me. I <laughs> it's it's just one of those things that that symmetry that like you mentioned, man. <laughs> I I I am impressed yeah. by the well with and with the money from the boat he from stole. the boat that's, he I mean, stole. Yeah, that's the. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I I just it's it's an incredible story and I I really do hope we get to see that in uh in film one day. The I think that one of the maybe yeah. the one that's being worked on right now they describe it as Glory meets Ocean's 11, which I think is a, a, a an interesting uh, way to put it. It sounds like an apt description. Apt quite a caper yeah. to to steal that bow and to have everything prepared so that he could do it. And I the fact that it went off the way that it did really is impressive. Yeah, yeah. I mean, from a movie standpoint, it might be not have enough tension to it because everything went well, <laughs> right? You know, I mean, it didn't. They, but uh, it's uh, so we'll have to see it. We'll have to see if they have to embellish that a little bit because he planned it so well and everything went well. But but uh, uh, yeah, I, uh, well, up until the end when they were going to fire on him and and uh, they yeah, made an American flag and and the first thing he asked when he gets there he says, Do "You have an American flag I can fly so that no one in the blockade shoots at us." Uh, yeah, I, I look forward to that. I mean, it was it was a pleasure to make that episode. Uh, it was one of my earliest episodes. It's one of the things that established the channel. And it is someone who absolutely meets that, that basic standard. History deserves to be remembered. I mean, he's the model, the very model of that. And honestly, you know, he stole the boat on high seas. So, you know, among other things, he was a pirate. That's right. Yeah? and Because all good stories involve pirates. Exactly. Magellan TV is sponsoring this episode, and they sponsor all of our podcasts. And if you've listened to the podcast, you know that what we like to do is talk about what we've been watching on Magellan TV lately. And so what have you been watching on Magellan TV? I, I watch a lot on Magellan. I want to say, uh, by the way, I want to mention, because I saw in the new airs that they have a, a documentary on Bessie Coleman. Uh, I haven't watched that one yet, uh, but we did an episode on Bessie Coleman, and she is, like Robert Small, she's this person that just never let obstacles get in her way. Uh, that. And, and I really, I would recommend, if you don't know who Bessie Coleman is, uh, then Magellan's got a, a, a video on her. I haven't gotten to watch it yet, but I will. But, I mean, she's someone that absolutely deserves to be remembered. I actually was watching uh, nature documentary stuff. I mean, always, uh, there's so much to see on there, but sometimes, you know, I, I, I want something. It's kind of funny on a documentary channel, but I want something kind of light. So I was uh, watching part of the series, which is called Fish Life. Fantastic, absolutely stunning, uh, high definition footage underwater. I grew up in South Dakota, and I'm, there's no way you're ever getting me under the ocean. That's, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, there's, 
and that's where that stuff lives and I don't. So, so I mean, so it's, I really, really enjoy the footage because I'm never going to go dive down there. Uh, and honestly, I think it's maybe aimed at a little bit of kids. But one of the things that's interesting is that, you know, uh, some of our viewers know I have a 15-year-old here in the house. She, she very rarely watches documentaries, uh, and she's not a big fan of the history guy, to be honest. History's not necessarily her thing. Uh, but uh, but she has to, she's a great artist, and some of her art has been in some of the history guy videos, if you look carefully. But she actually came over and wandered and was watching it with me, which I thought was really huh. cool. So, so uh, Fish Life is a series uh, that's just talking about how fish live under the ocean. The one that I was watching was talking about how they do locomotion under the ocean. Uh, fascinating to watch the high definition, up close footage of these very extraordinary creatures and all the different ways that they you know, ambulated. The what Willow, my daughter, was saying, you know, what if people could do that? Well, what if we could just, you know, fly around? Uh, and that's that's you know, imagine the fish world. It's completely different. Yeah. And that was cool to watch. Uh, and so uh, I just I had a great time uh, watching. It's just one of the, one of the reasons that you love a documentary channel like Magellan TV is because uh, they get such spectacular footage of things that, you know, it would be very difficult for me to go see because unless you tie a rock to me, there's no way I'm going under. Uh, and, I, you know, I would say that this one's probably more aimed maybe towards kids. Uh, I, I mean, it's as, as, a, as a documentary, but I mean, I, I, I really, I mean, it was a great way to pass time. I was just looking around the other day trying to choose something, and I ended up finding this thing called, this one called Tumai, the oldest living ancestor. And so it's anthropology. I've always been interested in anthropology. Um, I have a, I've got a minor in history in my degree, but I had considered, uh, considered doing an anthropology minor as well, just because I find it so interesting. So what this was about is this was about a specific skull that they found in Chad and they had found this one skull it was kind of crushed when they found it but so this talked about how they after they found it they tried to change you know, tried to like digitally figure out what its shape would have been before it got crushed and stuff like that and it's amazing because this this skull that they found is still what possibly considered to be one of the earliest uh, ancestors of humans and so this one is called Solanthropus chadensis and then also how they figure out how it might have walked and apparently there's some stuff we've learned about since this uh, came out uh, that kind of argued about whether whether or not it was bipedal that they have this narrator who's narrating like as the skull or as the soul of this animal that was in there <laughs> so it's kind of it's 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 funny every once in a while it's that he'll say something and you're like ah ha, ha, ha. <laughs> but it's it was really quite interesting and for anyone who's you know interested in kind of that stuff about uh, anthropology and how humans might have evolved it's it's really interesting to see we know so little about it still so i i really enjoyed that again it's called to my the oldest living ancestor and of course if you are a listener or watcher of the history guy you can always go to try.magellantv.com slash history guy where we will always have a deal for you sometimes a free month or a deal on an annual membership or even a documentary that you can watch for free Again, that's try.magellantv.com slash history guy. Next up, the history guy tells the story of Abraham Galloway, an escaped slave who became an effective spy for the Union during the Civil War. There's been a lot said and written about black leaders in the era of the U.S. Civil War and Reconstruction, people like Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman, but there were many more who struggled for their people's freedom whose names are relatively unknown. And among those is Abraham Galloway, an escaped slave who risked his life, his freedom, repeatedly as a Union spy, materially impacted the war, and served tirelessly throughout his lifetime to realize the promise of the Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal. His story deserves to be remembered. Abraham H. Galloway was born in the tiny town of Smithville, North Carolina in 1837 to 17-year-old slave Hester Hankins and John Wesley Galloway, a free white man and son of a planter. Though it was rare for white men to recognize their children by slaves, Abraham said that his father recognized me as his son and protected me as far as he was allowed to do so. Abraham was owned by Marsden Hankins, who was only seven years his senior. He was trained as a brick mason from the age of 10. Nearby Wilmington was one of the busiest ports in the South during the cotton boom in the first half of the 19th century. The boom gave Abraham plenty of work, which he was free to seek on his own while Marsden worked his own trade. Galloway was expected to contribute $180 to the household annually, but otherwise enjoyed a fair amount of freedom of his time. He spoke with other blacks and was able to stay appraised of national news. As Galloway would later put it, in 1857 he and a friend decided that liberty was worth dying for. 
and it was their duty to strike for freedom, even if it should cost them their lives. At the same time, immigrants also threatened Galloway's ability to make the $180 his master expected, and Galloway may have feared that he would be sold. Galloway and his friend risked much to find a captain who would hide them among his cargo, and neither spoke much about who they found or how they got aboard his boat in secret. They hid among naval stores, barrels of tar, rosin, and turpentine, but danger remained. Authorities would fumigate ship holds with burning turpentine dross to flush out hiding slaves. The fumes had an effect like tear gas and could even be lethal. The escapees planned to cover themselves with a shroud and held pig bladders full of water to moisten their faces if the gas started pouring down. Fortunately, they didn't have to test their homemade solution. The boat wasn't fumigated. On the trip, they grew sick from leaking turpentine fumes in the hold, but when they disembarked in Philadelphia, they were free. They received assistance from prominent abolitionists in the Underground Railroad who helped them reach Canada out of the range of the Fugitive Slave Act. Before he left, Galloway posed for a photo, an etching of which is the only confirmed surviving image of him. They traveled to Kingston, Ontario, just across the border from New York. Galloway wouldn't stay in Canada long, according to his friend, publisher Robert Hamilton. He wandered all over this country and Canada. In 1860, he even spent 15 weeks in Haiti, where a colony was been organized for escaped slaves. Galloway returned to the U.S. on April 1st, 1861, 11 days before the attack on Fort Sumter. He immediately went south, as one colleague described it, to incite insurrections. Actually, on the recommendation of influential Boston industrialist George Stearns, 24-year-old Galloway had been recruited as a spy. Galloway was determined to take action for his brothers in slavery, and some union leaders realized that former slaves would make good spies. They knew how to blend in in the South, were used to hiding and traveling in secret, and wouldn't betray the Union for a bribe. As a Union colonel later said, they had been spies all their lives. Galloway joined General Benjamin Butler, who had been put in charge of Fortress Monroe in Hampton, Virginia, one of the few remaining Union strongholds in Confederate territory. As official intelligence gathering channels did not exist yet, Galloway reported directly to Butler and was said to possess his fullest confidence. Much of what he did is lost to history, but he frequently went behind enemy lines and was known to be highly effective. Fortress Monroe was quickly inundated with escaping slaves, and while he had no official orders, Butler took them under his protection as contraband of war, utilizing what intelligence they brought and providing shelter and food. Galloway helped organize an enormous slave spy network, which even had a member in the Confederate White House in Richmond. Among the many intelligence missions Galloway participated in was to scout for landings for an invasion of North Carolina, accomplished by Ambrose Burnside in the winter of 1861, which secured much of the coastline for the duration of the war. This was the land where Galloway had been born and lived most of his life, and he and other slaves who acted as pilots to assist Union forces to navigate the waterways were integral in its capture. Galloway next joined Butler when he was tasked with taking New Orleans, which they did in short order. Galloway did scouting work and determined that Vicksburg was too heavily defended for Butler to take. They tried to bypass Vicksburg by digging a canal, and Brigadier General Thomas Williams confiscated more than a thousand slaves to do the work. Those slaves, and apparently a captured Galloway, were abandoned when the Union gave up on the plan. How Galloway was captured or what happened next isn't clear. He never told anyone the full story or how he escaped and reappeared on the North Carolina coast, a journey of nearly a thousand miles. Galloway lost some faith in the Union from this episode, and once in North Carolina turned his attention to helping the escaped slaves who had clustered on the coast. The former slaves played pivotal military roles in the theater. One colonel said, in all our expeditions, we have depended upon Negroes for our gods, for without them, we could not have moved with any safety. Galloway seemed, maybe unofficially, to be in charge of these men. His work in the contraband communities also gave birth to a new side of himself, the political organizer. He gained a reputation for a wry sense of humor, was said to laugh, well and often. Northern journalists described him as fearless and audacious. He was also instrumental in getting former slaves to enlist with the Union Army. In May of 1863, Edward Kinsley, an abolitionist and wool merchant, arrived with a mission given by Lincoln to assess the possibility of recruiting former slaves. But to his surprise, he found no one that was interested. When asked why, they directed him to Galloway. By befriending Marianne Starkey, who ran a boarding house that was a primary contact between black leaders and Union command, he was eventually introduced to Galloway and other black leaders in the dead of night in Starkey's attic. Galloway said he didn't trust the Union, disliked the cavalier way that Union leaders enlisted blacks for labor, among other mistreatment. He had three demands. That black soldiers be paid as much as white ones, that the soldiers' families would be cared for, 
and most importantly, that the Union Army compelled the Confederacy to treat black soldiers as prisoners of war and not escape slaves or traitors. The last demand was the hardest, because Kinsley knew he could not keep that promise. Still, eventually he agreed to it, and the black leaders had Kinsley swear an oath to it while holding revolvers against his head. A few days later, Kinsley had his recruits, hundreds of former slaves of Herculean proportion, more than 5,000 would eventually enlist from around New Bern, and 186,000 blacks would eventually serve, around half of them former slaves. Galloway spent the summer of 1863 as a recruiting emissary for the cause, reaching out to his many contacts and freedmen camps inside rebel territory. Galloway did one more mission as a Union spy for his old friend, General Butler. Butler had heard rumors that the POW camp at Point Lookout, Maryland, held many Confederates with Union sympathies, who could be convinced to enlist in exchange for their release. The camp was a miserable place, overcrowded and filled with desperate men fighting over meager supplies. Certainly most of the prisoners would be unhappy to find a black man in their midst. Though we don't know the content of Galloway's reports, by March of 1864, the first regiment of galvanized Yankees was sent to the Dakota frontier. Even as the war entered a bloody stalemate, Galloway was confident that the South would lose and that he needed to start looking towards the future. In 1864, he decided to move his efforts from the cartridge box to the ballot box. To that end, on April 29, 1864, Abraham Galloway and five others formed the first delegation of Southern black leaders to meet the President of the United States. From the start, the delegation was shocked at their good treatment. They were allowed in the front door, something of heard of in the South, where blacks were expected to come around the back. Lincoln was said to have treated the delegation with respect and dignity. As Frederick Douglass had said, Lincoln was the first great man I talked with in the United States freely, who in no single instance reminded me of the difference of color. The petitioners sought a promise that Lincoln would finish the noble work you have begun and grant unto your petitioners the greatest of privileges to exercise the right of suffrage. Galloway knew that blacks, especially in the South, would struggle after the war and that voting rights were one of the few ways that he would be able to fight back. Lincoln expressed his support but did not promise the petitioners anything. Galloway's speeches across the North that year were hopeful and he was said to make those laugh who had never laughed before. Still, Galloway was reminded of the lesser place blacks still held. Repeated massacres of black troops at Fort Pillow, Fort Wagner, Milliken's Bend, and Suffolk, Virginia, and the reticence of northern leaders to discourage them reminded him that even then the North saw black soldiers as less valuable than white ones. When Lincoln was killed, he joined the board for the National Lincoln Monument. Galloway was selected as one of a handful of southern delegates who attended the National Convention of Colored Men in October 1864. It was the first national meeting of black leaders, and it created the first national civil rights group, the National Equal Rights League. Galloway was named one of the 16 vice presidents of the League. His speaking tour afterwards can be characterized by a single line. I am God's free man, and I feel I am ready to do all I can to lift up my own oppressed brethren. He helped to found the first state chapter of the National Equal Rights League in North Carolina. Auxiliary chapters were founded all over the coast. He was elected president of the League in New Bern, where Moorhead City dubbed itself the Abraham H. Galloway Equal Rights League. Galloway demanded public schooling for black children, in addition to voting rights, so as to be an educated people and an intelligent people. If the Negro knows how to use the cartridge box, he said, he knows how to use the ballot box. He even said he was willing to agree to literacy tests for voting if they were applied equally to blacks and whites. And I tell you that this, if this is done, one half the white people of North Carolina will be debarred from voting. Violence was endemic between blacks and whites in the first days after the Confederacy collapsed. North Carolina held a constitutional convention without inviting any blacks to reinstate the antebellum order, while at the same time a Freed People's Convention was held across town, where Galloway and others asked for citizenship, public schooling, and equal treatment under the law. Galloway was called perhaps the most remarkable person among the delegates. At home, Galloway faced the threat of regulators, white militias, and soon the Ku Klux Klan, at least once, Galloway was forced to flee for his life. There is no protection for the colored people, he said. Our lives are always in danger. In 1867, the Republican Congress passed the Reconstruction Acts, which forced southern states to pass constitutions that guaranteed universal male suffrage. Galloway seized this opportunity in support of the Republican cause wholeheartedly. I stand here as a representative of the Republican Party, neither Republican black man or Republican white man, but the Republican Party. Galloway served as a delegate to the 1868 North Carolina Constitutional Convention, even though the press derided it as a kangaroo convention that would write a guerrilla constitution. Afterwards, he was put up for the state senate in the first race where blacks were allowed to hold statewide office. 
threatened whites engaged in mass voter intimidation when people were writing that the only way to defeat growing black political power was the stern and bloody experiences of the battlefield. For fear of his safety, Galloway constantly carried a revolver. While giving a speech, he was attacked by a man with a bowie knife, and he barely escaped a lynch mob. He was also chosen as the first black presidential elector in North Carolina history. In the Senate, he constantly challenged white politicians, refusing to obey traditional rules of deference. One paper called him the pugilistic Indian senator, in reference to his mixed blood, while another called him the colored Napoleon. He was always ready for a fight, and even threatened duels with senators who could not give him respect. If white people don't like their legislation, he said, they can leave. He faced constant racism, both in his personal life and in legislation, which declared that blacks were naturally inferior to whites. When a bill raising train ticket taxes was announced, he accused it of trying to price out black citizens, and rightly added, pass this bill, and you encourage horse stealing. When a colleague said the KKK was necessary to assure order and curb black criminality, Galloway shouted the man down. How could he justify the deeds and outrages of this miserable and contemptible organization? He was a major political supporter of labor and women's rights during his tenure. He twice proposed bills to amend the state constitution to extend suffrage to women. Tragically, at the height of his political career, shortly after having been re-elected to the North Carolina State Senate, Abraham Galloway died suddenly on September 1st, 1870, of a fever and jaundice. Some 6,000 people attended his funeral. One newspaper said that it was possibly the largest funeral in the state's history. He had survived so many attempts on his life, only to die of natural causes at just the age of 33. Shortly after his death, conservative Southerners resurged in what was called the redemption to overthrow the Reconstruction era. In his time, Abraham Galloway was one of the most dynamic and popular of the Southern black leaders. He believed he had a cause that was larger than his own life, but he never learned to read and write, and so left behind very little to describe his own thoughts. And black codes and Jim Crow laws conspired to bury his memory. He was really only rediscovered in 2012 when a biography about him was written and a marker was erected near his hometown of Wilmington. The year before his death, he gave a speech that perhaps best described his life work. He said, I care not about the living present, but there must be a deep foundation laid for the coming generation. Although he is very little remembered, Galloway cuts quite a figure. He had a absolutely mm -hmm. just an acerbic wit and he was incredibly talented for both politics and spycraft. And I think that's one of the things that's so amazing. And the things that tie him and Robert Smalls together and not just their situations. Oh, yeah. But it does make you wonder how, how a man like this is so completely forgotten. Yeah, I, I, there's lots of reasons for that. But part of it is uh, after, after Reconstruction ended, then there was an aggressive effort to hide these sorts of stories because they didn't, you didn't want heroes. Uh, the Freedmen heroes. You didn't, uh, but I mean, it is uh, that's one of the most extraordinary things about Galloway is that this story had to be rediscovered uh, yeah. before uh, before we even would have heard it. So, uh, and you know, an interesting thing here. Uh, this is if everybody doesn't know, Josh writes scripts for the History Guy. This is a script that you wrote, uh, and 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 you found this character. He's he's so many parallels with Robert Smalls in terms of the risks that he was willing yeah. to take, and, and that he took those during the war, and then he could always have been reenslaved once you escaped, you would go back behind lines again. Uh, and uh, also, uh, the, they both were so instrumental in recruiting uh, black troops into the Union, which ended up being very important by the end of the war, uh, but uh, uh, that, that, that his story was lost, that it was forgotten, that it had to be rediscovered, yeah. and that, I mean, this literally almost became forgotten history. That adds another twist of what's just fascinating. This, this is another superhero. This is another one of the X-Men uh, to find. Uh, do I get in trouble if I say X-Men? Is that owned by somebody? I, I don't know. But uh, this <laughs> is another person who, who, who could be in his own cinematic universe uh, with Robert Smalls, uh, and with it, it's even that much more. And, and you know, maybe it's fitting for someone who was a spy that his that his story was maybe less remembered because maybe he was. That's what he always did was keep sure. his secrets. Uh, but uh, I, it's so great that it did come to light because he definitely deserves to be remembered. Absolutely, and I mean, I think how I ultimately discovered him was probably from that book that the 2012 one, which kind of uncovered his story, and we were able to get some. Uh, some info, some information about him, uh, even some you know firsthand accounts and stuff that I, was difficult would have been difficult to find otherwise. And so I, I remember I, I read the book. I think I had learned about him a little bit beforehand, probably reading about the book. But it was so cool to be able to see that he had uh, 
we had all of what we do have about him because he, unlike Robert Smalls, uh, he did not become literate. Uh, he never he never learned to read or write, and he was busy doing doing his other stuff. But Smalls did eventually teach himself how to read and write. Galloway ended up just having to essentially. I mean, he was able to do everything he did. He even even as an elected official, without ever writing, and yet still managing to be based on some of his quotes and some of his conversations with other people, often the smartest guy in the room. <laughs> uh, so I, I think it's really an interesting story, and I, I, I love being able to uncover some of this stuff, especially stuff that, you know, just literally was lost for all these various reasons, partially because he never did write his own story. And if, you know, if he'd been able to write something yeah. down himself, then, then it would be something that maybe could have been uh, more easily rediscovered. But having to piece it together from all the various you know, records that you can find is a much more difficult task. And it's it's hard to. The, it is. We find other historical figures that are in that same position. Yeah. They didn't record their own story, and so you, you you always have to wonder what story's been recorded. You know, because was it a friend or a foe that was telling the story? And by the way, that book is "The Fire of Freedom: Abraham Galloway and the Slaves Civil Wars" by David Sasselsky. Uh And uh, and David, if I mispronounce your name, I'm sorry. Uh, we do. I mean, it's a, it's a good point to talk about. We do research a number of different ways in the history guide. We don't usually create uh, bibliographies, and we don't just because we use so many references and sources, and you know we're not purporting to be a book is what we're doing. I mean, so it would just be a, it would just be too much to add for a you know, like a video sort of thing. But that doesn't mean that we want to ignore the the, the sources that we've used and the work acknowledge the work that they did. And this yeah. one, it's really worth mentioning that particular book. Uh, I didn't read the book, but apparently, uh, but I mean, it's certainly. Uh, I mean, he's an extraordinary story. I would highly recommend. Uh, that book, and it's, uh, and we want to make sure and give credit to him. The Fire of Freedom, Abraham Galloway and the Slave Civil War. Uh, and we often, when you when you look at the history guy, uh, sometimes an episode will uh, largely derive from a single book, but we use actually uh, many sources when we put together our episodes, and that's one of the reasons that we don't give you a, you know, a full bibliography. It's yeah. one of the reasons why, honestly, tell people that we probably shouldn't be used as an academic ref reference. I mean, if you're doing a paper for school or something like that, uh, because we're not really claiming to be professional historians that way. And it's, it's important to note that because there are, there's a code of standards for professional historians, which includes that everything is going to be specifically referenced. That's something that just doesn't fit well with the YouTube format. And so that's, yeah. that's why we're not trying to claim to be that. And we don't want to, we don't want to oversell and claim to be what we're not. We're storytellers. They're telling stories of history. But uh, we do get that often from the, the work of others who put a lot of work into it. And, and so it's, it's worth it to mention the title of the book. Absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's one of those things. Sometimes I will be reading that book on my own and find a story that's worth telling. Uh, I've been reading a biography of all the presidents, which I will get through someday. Uh, <laughs> but a lot of times I'll find pieces of stories in there that are that I really feel like are worthy of talking about. Uh, other times, you know, you find a topic and I'll go try to find some information on it. And, when, and then when I'm doing the research, I'll find a book and I look, get through it. My, my wife is a librarian. So I can always get these books somehow. Sometimes it takes a while to get them through the interlibrary loan system. Uh, but that's that's another good good reason to thank a library and thank a librarian is that those they'll get those books to us. But I agree it's it's important that we even though we are we don't put our bibliography out there. I mean we're we're using sources and we use a lot of sources. And I, I, I spend a lot of time, honestly, uh, trying to make sure that if there's a claim someplace, that I can back that up in a source somewhere. <laughs> a lot of times uh, our titles of the videos will be will be direct quotes from other things. So that's 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 really where we're at. So mm -hmm. we're trying to tell these stories. And I think it's I think it's cool to talk about kind of mm -hmm. how we get those, because ultimately I get them from all over it is, the place. Yeah. Uh, I I, yeah. I end up looking a lot. I will admit that I've searched more than once little known history stories, although I've kind of figured out that now mm -hmm. uh, you do that enough times and they're, they kind of list all the same, all the same things. Every top 10, oh, the same yeah, ones, yeah. The top 10 least known history stories. Yeah, but you stories. can, I mean, there's lots of things, but we are good Googlers. I mean, it is, it is fair to note that we're not, we're not primarily primary historians. We're not going out and finding, you know, death records and things like that. Uh, we are primarily using secondary research, which means someone else did the research. We are synthesizing a lot of that in order to turn that into a story that we hope will spark people's interest yep. in history. Uh, but uh, we're not trying to steal from anybody. We're not trying to plagiarize from anybody. We do want to acknowledge that we're getting this from a lot of other different works. Uh, and where we have a work like this that, uh, that so significantly impacted an episode, I think it's worth it to mention the name of the author and the name yep. of the book, uh, because they deserve to get not just credit, but I mean, gosh, by the book. It's a, it's a great book. Yeah, absolutely. 
and there's a lot more in there. Uh, ultimately, when we're putting these stories together, we you just have to leave stuff out, uh, stuff that is oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> stuff that is cool, but is not necessarily yeah. relevant to the the very the yeah you, you couldn't you couldn't fit the whole story yeah. of any of any whole book, and, and, and we're using sometimes dozens of books. You couldn't yeah. fit all of that into a fifteen minute story. I mean, there's a re there is there's a reason that we do what we do, uh, but uh, the the goal is not to keep people from studying history; it's to get people to study history more. Uh, so and always. you know, there's something else you mentioned that I think's worth mentioning because I think people will ask, you know, who is Josh uh, aside from He's the history guy's son. He's my oldest son. I have two sons and a daughter. Uh, the son's grown. The daughter's still 15. Uh, and uh, to give you an idea of how much he loves history, too, which I hope I had some role in that, but because he passed by this, Josh is committed to seeking out and then reading a quality biography of every president of the United States. Uh, and you know, there's not a lot of people who've made a choice to do that. But I mean, that, that shows, you know, his, his commitment to history and how he spends his time and one of the reasons why he's here on the podcast. And Absolutely. one of the reasons that I'm so honored to have him as part of the History Guy team. I think mean, it's, it's a huge contribution since we hired, I think it was what, just a year ago, right? We hired yeah, last about, year, a, uh, about a year to now. come on full time as, as an employee of the History Guy. One of the things that we tasked you with immediately was to create a podcast and you've done a brilliant job of it. And it's because you have that passion for history that it's it's a joy. Uh, history deserves to be remembered, and I'm so glad that you agreed because there's nothing really better than being able to work with your son. Well, and I've always I, I've always liked reading as well, and the I've kind of found as I've gotten through it that the biographies are really uh, an in, an interesting way to to look at history because they're they you get to see so many different things that happen in history around these folks. But I think it gives you a very interesting perspective on each one of these individuals' lives. Uh, but I, but one of the things I, I really like to say is that, you know, no one ends up president by accident, even though there are a number of presidents who they've called, uh, I think they called John, T John Tyler his accidency. Uh, <laughs> but, it, you know, there's a reason why those people are all in those positions. And so I, I, th I f found it a very interesting way to look at American history. Uh, I'm up through Teddy Roosevelt. I, I just read uh, oh, Edmund Morris, Edmund Morris's trilogy on, on Teddy Roosevelt, which is absolutely wonderful. Oh, okay. Masterpiece, honestly. Yeah. I haven't read that one. I've read several Roosevelt biographies. Everybody knows I was a, I was a ranger at Mount Rushmore, uh, and of course Teddy Roosevelt is on Mount Roosevelt. It's on Mount Rushmore, and uh, and so uh, I've done some good research on, on him back in the day. Amazing person in many ways, uh, but I haven't yeah. read the, the three volume biographies. It's yeah. it's a it's a really good set. I really I really recommend that one. I think it's one of my favorites. Um, I try I try to do it in one volume if I can, but for someone like Teddy, there's just there was no way they could fit that in the. Well, I mean, people have tried. You can, but it was very good as a yeah. trilogy. I'm a big fan of David McCullough's <laughs> Morning on Horseback. Uh, but he's a very famous historian. But uh, but it stops before his political career. It goes right up to uh, when yeah. he first runs for mayor of New York City, which of course he lost. He really lost his first election. He knew it. That was actually why I, I why I didn't end up reading that one, and I'll probably go back to it. But because I, I tend to try to find one that's that is specifically a biography of their whole life. Uh, there's a lot of, especially for like the, you know, the lesser studied presidents, it can be a little difficult because there are some that will look at their presidencies, yeah. but I want their whole life. Um, actually, I, the, the one I have for Taft that's next is a, is a pair of books too. He was a little difficult to find a biography that fit all of my exacting specifications um, <laughs> uh, to, to find one that, that met everything that I wanted it to meet. But it, it's, it's a really cool way to read history. I recommend it if you're, if you're interested in doing it. I've been reading them in order, um, but you don't have to. It's, I also, there's, a, there's some places to try to figure out which ones are the best biographies, which is it's something of a trick. I would say there's a lot of different biographies that are very good. Yeah, um, I think we'll find a place uh, either on the webpage, uh, historyguide.com, or on the locals page, historyguideguild.locals.com, and have you post uh, the, the bibliography, have you post the list of books that you chose oh, to read. And, yeah, uh, absolutely. That would be, uh, that's, so that's, you're right, that's, so that's really interesting. People can see your choice, yeah. Uh, yeah. If you want to take on this project, Josh will have done some of the research for you for his exacting yeah. standards over what, what, what books yeah, to choose. Yeah, I, I always do, because I've seen some people, there, and there's some good biographies that I think I've, I've passed up for various reasons, or some good books uh, that, I, that didn't do exactly what I wanted them to. Um, but getting back to what we what we were talking about for the episode uh this was a you know we're talking about galloway it really is interesting to me one of the one of the things is that he was uh he was a supporter of women's rights and i, I think that's an interesting uh, combination which i mean it makes sense to me they're both minorities uh but he was i mean he was supporting the women women's right to vote decades 
before that would happen. Mm -hmm. And I, I, there were movements in, in the 19th century, but nothing that was really approaching success, you know, until after the 20th. And I think that's a really, I think it's an interesting thing that he was willing to fight that battle when he had so many of his own battles. His own battles to fight, yeah. I mean, it's just another example of uh, how brave he was, but it also is an example of that he could apply his experience uh, and understand how, what that meant. Uh, and uh, yeah, he's, uh, again, uh, like Robert Smalls, this is a person that's just, uh, he, he, he makes choices he doesn't have to make. I liked uh, Galloway's take on literacy tests, that if it were applied fairly, one half of the white people of North Carolina will be barred from voting. And I think that that's a, it's an interesting thing to talk about because literary tests, literacy tests were rarely uh, applied fairly, were they? I mean, certainly they were used as a way to try to exclude black people. So of course they were being applied unfairly. They were being yeah. applied differently. Yeah. We mentioned that actually uh, even after the post reconstruction era in the, in the video that we actually posted this morning on the, on the YouTube channel. Uh, but the effort was uh, post reconstruction, the effort was to use anything that you could to keep black people from voting. Uh, and of course you were trying to keep white people from voting. So you just didn't apply the same, same standard. They so, would, I mean, uh, anything that you were doing, poll taxes or literacy tests or, or property tests or whatever you were doing, uh, if you applied it equally, uh, you would have lost, lost votes too. Ultimately, I, I mean, how they did that legally is that they, they figured out ways, like grandfather clauses that would be like, oh, you don't have to take a literacy test if, if uh, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and, but on, mm -hmm. honestly, they probably just sometimes just didn't, simply didn't put the literacy test to people, to white people who may not have been able to pass it. And they just, you just let that, let that yeah, slide. Yeah. And the, 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 there were times yeah, there. You probably, you know, you, yeah, it's, I mean, you got the, you know, the people that were running the yeah. show, they were doing this for a reason and they knew who to let in and who not to let in. And partially that's what gives, that's, that's what makes Smalls and Galloway stand out so much is because they, they knew that. And they were fighting, especially after the war, when they were fighting for political representation, uh, you know, they knew that that fight was on them and that they couldn't necessarily rely on the the people who had freed them from slavery or you know the war that freed them from slavery they knew that ultimately it was going to be on them and so they they had to push for that and i okay, and and like you said with robert smalls right. uh, they they faced they faced a lot of danger after the war yeah, uh, yeah. just for just for trying. yeah absolutely I, th I think i think at one point someone tried to stab him uh, and uh, I think they both ended up being armed because yeah. they're at risk. But I mean, the thing is, so much of it was done by intimidation. So much of it done was playing on on naivete. And these are two men that that wasn't going to work on. Yeah. These are two men who had faced greater danger uh, than a red shirt. Uh, and, yeah. uh, I mean, they, they call them red shirts, right? Uh, and they faced greater danger than those guys, and and uh, and they, you know, they were willing to stand up to him. And that's uh, so. There, you know, that heroism was required after the war. It's tragic to say that you yeah. even had it to. But I mean, it was what they learned in the war that made a difference you know, later on in their ability to to you know continue to fight for a cause. And it ends up being, I mean, it's incredibly tragic that Galloway was only 33 when he died. Mm -hmm. And I, it's, I don't want to say ironic exactly, but there is, there is something incredible about the fact that even though so many people tried to kill him so many different times and he did so many different dangerous mm -hmm. things, he died of natural causes. And it's yeah, he's died of a fever. Yeah, yeah, and it's well, I mean, it's, you know, so life was rough. Yeah, yeah, this, still this right is before we identified viruses. You know, this, <laughs> there was a lot of things that we were missing. So yeah, uh, yeah so uh, uh, yeah, I mean, that shows you it's another thing about the era too. I mean, you can still just die today, right? Oh yeah, I mean, you, you die of COVID, but uh, uh, but this you know we we don't always appreciate all that we have today. One of the things is it's a lot harder to just drop dead of a fever today. That was actually fairly easy to do. Yeah. In the 19th century, we didn't have any real treatment for fever, yeah. and uh, so uh, it, it just tells you all the other things that they face. You know that you can face guns and knives and, and sneaking behind enemy lines and being around people who would kill you if they knew who you were, uh, and you could still just be laid low by uh, a regular run-of-the-mill infection uh, because we had no way to, to reduce infection. Thank you for listening to this episode of the History Guy podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Forgotten History, and if you did, you can find more on our website, thehistoryguy.com. We release podcasts every two weeks, so stick around if you want to hear more podcasts of Forgotten History. You can also find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and Patreon. You can even get a personalized message from the History Guy himself on Cameo.